All right, uh, let's get started. So today we're going to build on some of the things we looked at last time, um, processes and threads, and uh, look at some, of the, some more details of how those are implemented and what their implications are. All right, so we'll review some of that material from last time. Uh, so it all looks familiar. Um, we'll look at how uh, threads get dispatched and um, how they can cooperate with each other and give some examples of concurrency. And we'll also sort of clear up some of the terminology that was uh, left, we didn't quite get to last time. So um, multi-programming is the fundamental idea that's associated with processes. It's the idea of running multiple application programs at the same time on a processor. Um, <clears throat> it's actually an old idea, uh, so it predates interactive time-sharing systems. It uh, was originally used in mainframes that did batch processing, and basically it would pull several jobs into memory and switch between them uh, simply to utilize the CPU, so it would avoid uh, the CPU being idle when one of the jobs is waiting for an I.O. operation. Um, so, it, so it doesn't imply a sort of the real-time process uh, systems that we have today. But on the other hand, there aren't many multi-programming systems that aren't uh, interactive anymore <clears throat> because there aren't really any computers of that type. Um, so multi-program has become a bit of a synonym for, mu for multitasking which means uh, running those jobs with faster updates such that um, not only are there multiple virtual machines resident on one machine, but the perception of a user of any of those virtual machines is that they're actually running. They're not suspended for some amount of time. All right, so multi-programming is just simply that model that there are multiple resident processes in the one system's memory. <clears throat> and there's some regimen for switching between them and finishing all of them. Um, it, it typically involves encapsulation of each process as a virtual machine with its own copy of memory, uh, some kind of protected handle on the I.O. devices so that there isn't co conflict between the different, multi different programs running on those different virtual machines. <clears throat> so the process is this abstraction that captures a program plus its running state and is typically associated with a virtual machine perspective. Um, so the process is the thing running on the virtual machine, but the virtual machine is the thing that provides protection and an environment uh, that simplifies the programmer's task of writing the code of the process <clears throat> because from their perspective they're just coding effectively on one machine. Uh, so. <clears throat> um, Process creation certainly is expensive. Um, switching between sequential single-threaded processes is a little bit expensive, although we'll talk about that more. It's a lot less expensive than it used to be. Uh, primarily, we want concurrency between complex applications, and so that's why we use threads. Uh, within a process that's com large and complex, we typically want to be doing many things at the same time, perhaps dealing with a network, <coughs> dealing with a user interface and so on. And uh, those different threads of execution uh, can most easily perform efficiently if they have shared memory and so therefore uh, threads are a way to handle that. <coughs> so with the thread we have to, we, we separate the execution part of the process the runnable state of the process from the allocation of the virtual machine. Okay, so <clears throat> here's a, a, a Unix process. So it'll have the code over on the left, uh, the, a, a memory, it's a virtual machine so it has memory including a stack and a heap, um, some I.O. state and then the state of the CPU. So uh, this part here are the resources that are being replicated as part of this process. 
uh, for each, each, each process, uh, sort of the virtual machine part. Okay, the instruction stream is the conventional uh, sequence of instructions. And these, uh, these resources here are managed some way, like memory we saw last time was actually partitioned. The, the physical memory is partitioned between the processes, so each one has its own apparent memory copy. IO state is similarly, there are handles presented to each virtual machine so that the processes feel like they have access to everything. Um, the CPU state, there's only one CPU though, so uh, the operating system becomes responsible for at basically making and maintaining copies of that uh, that get swapped into the physical machine as you switch between processes. So that's the stuff that needs to get managed in order to do context switches between threads or processes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so uh, when you switch between different processes, uh, the switching overhead certainly used to be quite high. We're going to look at that in, more, in some more detail now because it's actually a much more complicated question what you mean by a context switch for a process when it's multi-threaded. But anyway, it's, it's more work than simply a thread switch. Um, there's a small amount of CPU state to manage. Uh, a lot of memory state to manage, that state has to be created and initialized when you start the process. And for that reason, the creation of a process is, is a lot of time. In fact, it's an arbitrary large amount of time because it can involve initializing a large block of memory. And also the, uh, typically a, a mapping table between the process's view of memory and the physical memory. Uh, but it does provide very high protection of the CPU and high protection of other resources. <coughs> um, yeah, and was we, we also saw last time that it's kind of expensive to do uh, shared memory. You have to somehow allocate blocks from different processes that are the same physical block. Um, and then also you have to do a context switch between them. So something written by one process can be read by another. Yeah. Uh, well, it's, uh, it, it's all the instructions that are run in between running the code of one process and the code of the other. So it's operating systems calls, um, you know, physical machine interrupts, uh, often some very expensive instructions that are saving lots of registers somewhere. There's quite a lot of hardware support now for context switching. So all of that is happening uh, in between, you know, when one thread stops and an, or one process stops and another one starts. So that's the overhead part. <coughs> All right. So let's see. Um, what? Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. And, and on a single uh, architecture, single CPU architecture, we're only running one process at a time. All right. Now, in contrast, um, threads, because they don't involve um, switching of memory or I/O resources have a somewhat lower switching overhead. Uh, they also have a lower creation overhead because a thread is going to be running in a particular memory environment of an, a lot containing process. So there's no need to initialize that memory. Uh, all that needs to happen is that the registers need to be sort of initialized for that thread and, and a stack, one or two stacks need to be created. That's a very small amount of overhead. The threads protect the CPU state whenever you do a context switch of a thread. Um, the old state gets saved and some new state gets read into the CPU, um, but the memory management's entirely up to the programmer. Uh, all the threads will have access to the same memory. Uh, yeah, and sharing, uh, the cost of sharing is, is low, meaning you can easily share data quickly between the threads because the context switching is fast. All right. <clears throat> um, and when you run this on multi-core processors, uh, uh, you even reduce somewhat the um, 
overhead of switching because there are actually registers, etc., on each of the cores, which can be potentially be running um, distinct threads. And so you avoid that overhead of storing and saving uh, registers as long as you're staying within one thread on each core. Okay. Let's see. Yeah, so for four threads without context switches, uh, there's no overhead. But what, uh, you typically you want to switch some of those threads with other threads and the usual overhead will come in. Um, <coughs> but if you think about it, it's only one, the, the switching overhead's only happening about one quarter as, as often. All right, and lastly, um, <coughs> hyperthreading is uh, a kind of a special support for threading where within each core, um, which by definition contains one copy of most of the CPU resources like arithmetic logic unit, uh, memory management, and so on, they do have, though, multiple copies of the, the core CPU state, namely the registers. Because a hyperthreaded core has multiple register sets, there's no need to switch the state between them, no need to save them and read them back in. Uh, so the context switch is, is often like a single instruction of the order of nanoseconds, which is much faster than uh, conventional <coughs> context switches. The downside, though, is that when you switch to your other set of registers, you may not be able to do anything because you may be waiting for uh, any of the other operations in, in the core to finish. <coughs> so hyperthreading gives you somewhere between a factor of one and two improvement most of the time. All right, <coughs> and last time we introduced the process control block. All right, so that's uh, current state of a process including things like um, the state that the process is in, whether it's uh, ready, running, et cetera, <coughs> a number <coughs> to identify it, its program counter, the register state, memory limits, and perhaps a map location, and then a list of the uh, I.O. resources. Yeah, question. Yeah. Yeah, so there's, there's two different, fla yeah. So the, this is for a classical process with one thread. There's a, a, typically a different structure called a PEB. I'm trying to remember the acronym for that, but that's, that's a, a process environment block, I think is the name of that thing. And that's typically used for multi-threaded processes and it doesn't have the, you instead have separate thread control blocks for the threads. <coughs> Um, okay, so, you know, we looked at last time at the switch <coughs> from process to process. So these process control blocks are bits of memory that save the running state of a, of a process. When you want to switch, you have to read that running state into the CPU. So <coughs> let's say we're executing a process P0. Um, when there's an interrupt or when it yields, then those objects on the previous slide get saved into a memory location, uh, you know, in the form of that PCB struct. And when you're done there, the uh, OS <coughs> can reload the state of it some other uh, ready process, put it back into the, the registers and so on of the CPU, and then basically transfer control to the PC address in that PCB, that causes the second process to start executing. And that will sort of iterate, will run for a while <coughs> until something makes it stop. It'll come back and save its state and so on. All right, so that's canonically what the context switch <laughs> is. Uh, and as we mentioned, the part in the middle, that code is typically running in the operating system. So along with these the horizontal arrows, there's often a change in uh, running mode from user mode to kernel mode and back again uh, associated with this. And that, that means that the code in the middle can typically access m many more critical resources than the user code. But when the user code runs, it, it uh, 
has access to its own resources. Okay. Um, yeah. So, uh, all right. So last time, someone asked about the actual practical times for doing this. So I went around and read some papers, and it's actually quite interesting. Um, <clears throat> so for a context switch in Linux, current Linux is. Um, it's around three to four microseconds to do that uh, on also current Intel uh, CPUs. <clears throat> but there are some surprising numbers around this. So actually, right now, there isn't much of a difference between context switching for a single threaded process versus a single thread. So it's definitely doing more work, but um, for a variety of reasons, that extra work, saving some um, processor state to do with the I.O. resources and so on, into memory is very fast. Anyone want to guess why that would be? Yeah. It, um, it does have some um, specialized hardware for context switching, and that uh, that helps, although, funnily enough, <coughs> it seems like a lot of the common operating systems aren't using the, uh, the, uh, the hardware instructions for context switching because they're a little bit too aggressive in saving the register state. So, so the operating system, the software, typically knows what exactly stuff it needs to save, and so Linux and Windows actually do that in software still. But there's another piece of hardware that can help saving and loading. Yeah. Yeah, so that's the key thing. Uh, although you've got to save this, um, this extra bit of state, it's not very big. It's sort of tens of words if it's, um, even if it's a memory map. I guess you don't hold, save the whole map. That's just a piece of memory. The point is it's not very much. Um, and it fits easily in the inner cache. And when you have threads running back and forth, even dozens of them, you're really not consuming much uh, memory. So that state that's flipping back and forth is sitting in the inner cache and is access accessible very, very fast. So in fact, um, the caching has really accelerated the context switching to the point where it's hardly different between processes and threads. Assuming that, again, that the process is a single thread. Okay, but there are some big differences in performance uh, depending on other factors. <coughs> so. The context switching if in a multi-core system, there's no particular reason that um, a, a, a particular process or thread will run on the same core the next time, right? It's normally going to run on an available core, which will often be different. So, you know, that has a, a bad cache consequence, right? Why is that bad from a caching point of view? Yeah? Yeah, so... The Intel machines have level one and level two in each core, so only level three is shared. So, yeah, so there's really fast cores won't, you know, they'll only have the state of that process if you run it before. And if you run it a long time before, it'll be stale. You have to update a lot. So, so in fact, there's big overheads head for switching across the cores. Another thing is that, um, uh, th there's a sort of related memory penalty which is related to working sets. So um, that's the part of the memory that the, the processor has been using recently. So this is not automatically managed, but when a process runs, it has something like a work, uh, it has something called a working set, which is a set of memory locations that it's just regularly hitting over an interval of time. When you stop the process, it's sort of ranging over the set of memory locations. When you start, it's going to range over the same set. Uh, in the meantime, other processes might have been ranging somewhere else and kind of pushed that working set out of the cache. So when you start your process again and it, has, it wants to you know, start using that memory again, <coughs> that memory has to get swapped back in. So if those working sets are large, and even in the tens of kilobytes, <coughs> suddenly the context switching becomes 
and this is like the net overhead. This doesn't happen instantly. It happens after your uh, process runs for a little while and starts, you know, moving over its working set. Yeah. Well, the, the, the process has all the stuff that's related to um, a, an entirely different memory, uh, virtual memory copy. The thing is that, that that state that's associated with a different memory copy is already is also in memory. Uh, so you're not moving it around. So, um, so, so basically, di different processes... Oh, I, should, I really want to show that picture from last time, but if you recall, it's a... There was a picture I showed with physical memory divided into blocks. Some of the blocks are associated with a process, process one. Some of the blocks are associated with process two. So um, processes are just dealing with different memory. There is some state needed, a small amount of state, to sort of tell the process to use, say, the blank locations versus the white locations. So that threads don't have that. All the threads running in this right-hand process are you know, they have exactly the same view of memory. So there is additional stuff associated with the process. But it just turns out that, that actually moving it around and changing it is very fast. Yeah? Well, no, I mean, no, the, the process, so I, well, you know, you, you can think of it as a process switch between these two processes as being a, threads, a thread context switch with a little bit extra, right? The extra is just changing around the memory map, roughly, and the I.O. map. So, yeah, that's valid. But again, you know, the, the process, the idea of a process and a thread is still distinct because one has this, uh, this extra stuff that makes the virtual machine uh, appear the way it does. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. If you if you have a, a yeah if you have a big process with lots of threads, um, switching between those threads is going to take about the same amount of time as as switching between two very simple processes that have a single thread, and we have both both kinds are pretty common. Um, <coughs> okay. All right. So the the working set I just explained that that's just the the set of memory locations that are used in a small amount of time. All right, so the lesson from this is that uh, context switching these days seem to depend mostly on memory access patterns, <coughs> caching, working sets, and a whole lot less on sort of the intrinsic differences between processes and threads. Yeah. No, that's a difference. Oh. That's slightly faster. Sorry, 100 nan nanoseconds difference. I'm sorry if you didn't. I'm sorry if that wasn't clear. That's a difference. So it's slightly faster because the the, the basic context switching time is three to four mi uh, microseconds. So the difference is about three percent. <coughs> okay. All right. So um, all right, but there's a big caveat, and you, we got into this already, which is uh, many processes are multi-threaded. So, and we have to be a bit careful what we mean by a context switch for one of those processes. That's more typically called suspending the process. Like if you actually take all the threads uh, out of the runnable state, then you're really doing 30 something, you know, 30 or 100 uh, thread context switches. And that's often orders of magnitude slower than, than single threading. So um, yeah, here's just a snapshot of my Windows box with the top process and then the number of threads. So you can see that a lot of the processes really are running lots of threads. What it doesn't show though is you get down here, there's a lot of single threaded processes too. So the ones down there context switch really fast. Um, these ones are actually rarely 
you know, the process itself is not really being switched in and out much. It's just coming in and the threads are being managed. Um, the, the, the operation at the process level is called suspending and that doesn't happen nearly as often. <coughs> and usually there's an, a, a special reason for doing it. All right. Is that clear? Yeah. So if there were to start off with a single client from a router, yeah. would this process just continue? Not in any written, no, pretty much their, their, um, their process context and maps would be sitting in memory and their threads would be actually, the, the threads would be in a runnable or um, a ready state in memory. So really all of this stuff would be sitting in memory most of the time. Only a small number of these would actually be active though. Yeah, but you really, Yeah, well, again, uh, stuff that's actually listed as, as, uh, as running is normally sitting in memory, taking up some memory. Um, and, well, yeah, exactly this much. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so, so processes that are active are consuming memory, even if they're not do Processes that are not suspended, uh, it doesn't imply they're actually running, the threads are running, but when they're active, um, yeah, they're consuming memory. <coughs> and, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot of the impact on memory these days is coming from the huge number of processes that people have, very few of which are actually doing real work most of the time. So, yeah. Yeah? Is there a memory that takes care of the Well, Well, not on a multi-core processor. So K of them will be running. <laughs> if you have K cores or, or two K. No, no, you can, because, because each of these is in effect running in a virtual machine, your, your OS can be running a thread from one <coughs> process and a thread from another process. You don't have to, because you, you, you can't run all of these at the same time anyway, so you've got to sort of pick and choose. Okay. All right, so, uh, well, we, we did a classification last time of operating systems based on number of address spaces, which is basically a number of processes, uh, and then <coughs> whether or not they supported multiple threads per address space. In other words, multiple threads per process. Um, so early operating systems only had a single thread, really, so uh, not even really processes. Uh, a lot of embedded systems emphasize threads over processes, so they're running sort of really just one process that uh, has many threads I in order to uh, minimize the consumption of memory. As you can see where our, uh, the Windows box I showed you is consuming tons of memory from these uh, processes that all have disjoint memory slots. When you only have a little bit of memory, that's not a good idea. So embedded systems tend to um, just have the one address space with lots of uh, threads in it. So Unix, uh, older Unixes tend to have the uh, single threaded processes in them. But now almost every operating system has <coughs> processes that support many different threads. All right, so it's starting to become clear. Okay, let's see, thread state. Um, so, uh, so th threads, when they're running in a process, they share all of the uh, I.O. and memory. So in particular, any kind of global variables, con constant memory heap is shared across all of the, uh, the threads. And the I.O. state is, w is as well. By design, it's done that way. <coughs> On the other hand, um, we already talked about the thread control block and registers, uh, which are also, by the way, stored in the thread control block when you're saving the, the thread. But what about the stack? Well, you know what a stack is, but where, is, where does that live? Go ahead. Yes, it does. 
No. No, 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 no. The process has multiple. If a process has multiple threads, it has multiple stacks. Uh, that's on the ne next slide. There's, there's no simple answer to that question. Um, you just have to figure out some scheme for doing that. Uh, <coughs> so, you know, a stack, it, it, it contains the local variables, uh, arguments to function, and also program counters, typically also frame pointers. So it's, it's stuff that's essentially uh, the, the complete state of each function call. So let's quickly review that. <coughs> so we have some code up here with a few functions calling each other. And then um, <coughs> if we work through the instructions in that code, and then look at the stack on the right-hand side. In initially, when we call that function A, um, it, it should have um, the argument, int, the parameter, temp, and then um, it also typically has uh, some memory allocated, stack memory allocated for the return value. You haven't generated the return value, but you need to save that space in case this function wants to call something else. You need to be able to save that space and write it later on. All right, so then we do some, another call. So the stack grows now. Um, Oh yeah, and I've got, I guess I've got a return, excuse me, I've got a return address too, which is a program counter value. Um, so in fact, I guess we, yeah. No, I'm sorry, I mixed things up. The, the ret our ret is, a, is an address since these functions aren't returning anything. If they were returning something, you'd need an extra location. Okay. So we call C, and because these functions take no arguments, have no local variables, all that we're putting on the stack is the return uh, program counter addresses. <coughs> so let's see, a, whoops, a, A2 had, actually did have an argument. So uh, when we push the frame associated with that call, then A gets the argument temp. Um, and so this is a recursive function. You can see we're back to calling A again <coughs> in a nested call. This time though, temp is not meeting the test, and so there won't be a recursive call. We'll just print something and then start returning. So as we return from A, we pop that frame of A back uh, off the stack. <coughs> and similarly as we return from C, that one comes off, return from B, that one disappears, and then A disappears. So hopefully that's all familiar. Um, <coughs> so, <coughs> uh, imagine we wrote a program that was a, 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 a thorough calculation of the digits of pi, and it would save all the digits of pi in the file pi.txt. Okay. Uh, what's the problem with this program as written? What's that? Yes. So, what's the... What's the downside of that? So the first one won't finish, and if we wanted to print the glass list, we won't get to it. All right, so yeah, so the behavior you described is correct. Basically, we'll keep running. Um, and you know, we have, in other words, a massive task, in fact, an un unbounded task that's running before a simple task. So we would rather <coughs> run that concurrently run those two uh, calculations concurrently. So that's shown schematically here. So we'd like to create a thread to run the first calculation. When you create a thread or fork a thread, uh, that call to fork the thread will return immediately. And then you'll execute the second piece of code while the first thread is, is still executing. All right, so create thread is, uh, we'll, we'll get into this more I next time, but it's going to actually create a whole copy of the current process, um, make some modifications to it, and then run that. Okay, so that starts an independent thread, and you can figure out what happens here, right? Both calculations run, which, you know, we'll get our uh, 
second calculation completing quickly long before the first one does. Okay. All right, so <clears throat> um, whether or not we have multiple physical CPUs, it behaves as though we had basically two different CPUs executing the code at the same time. Okay. Um, all right, so here we're getting into the, the details of these stacks. So uh, here's the memory space for the process. Uh, we have two registers which are in the two virtual CPUs. We don't see them here. But what's in memory is, you know, we said everything's shared between the two threads, so all of this is common. But the stacks are not shared. So in fact, we have to pick somehow two out two blocks of memory to allocate to those two stacks. So that's a complication of multi-threaded programming. That's the most significant complication. Uh, those two stacks can't just simply grow in the opposite, or they can't both grow in the opposite direction as the heap as you would with a single threaded process. With single threaded process, you don't know, worry about how to big to make the heap or the stack because you'll basically use everything until you run out. Here though, you've got to decide where to put the second stack. Um, and you know, it make, gives you more vulnerabilities to running out of memory sooner. And in fact, in general, for complex processes, you know, <coughs> I guess Firefox and so on, you had about 50 of them to situate in your memory space. So that's an open question. There's no simple answer, but you know, you have to somehow make some bounds on the the size of those stacks. In general, it's good to avoid uh, heavily recursive functions because those are the things that are going to chew up a lot of stack space. It's also good to avoid very large local variable arrays because those also use a massive amount of stack. Yeah. Uh, so we're already using virtual memory for different processes and other languages like that. So why not use something similar and like so if you thread something out of its own stack or the whole stack? All right. So that's that. That's a good question. So so should we actually? Well, it it doesn't quite um, doesn't quite solve the problem. It, prov it it's a protection step more than a, uh, a a resource step in the sense that you'd have to make the commitment for each virtual memory view. Like for one thread, you'd have to say here's well, it doesn't actually. There's a few complexities to doing that. Um, you could make a commitment that only a certain thread could see one of these stack uh, areas and write to it. And, but that implies that that thread then has a different map from the other thread, right? And it also applies that you ha it implies that you have to make a commitment in your memory map as to which blocks are the stack blocks. So it doesn't, it, it helps in terms of protection in that you can avoid um, thread one stack crashing into thread two. Th that would probably not have, that would probably be throwing an exception anyway even with a simpler scheme where they're in the same address space. But um, yeah, the, 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 the pe big penalty with that is that you s you've turned your threads into sort of almost processes in that they have to somehow have this additional state that knows which is the um, stacks associated with which thread. So there's, there's sort of a complexity penalty to doing that, yeah. I didn't quite get all of that question. The um, for our program, so for the stack that we're doing for the stack, yeah. is that implicit that each one of our threads is different? Well, no, that's by definition not happening. I mean, each thread has the same address space. If you have a program or a process with multiple threads, they all see the same address space. Well, but you still need to have them give them distinct stacks somehow. Although they can they can see each other's stack, but they they're only using one of the uh, one of those regions for their own stack, so that's a necessity. Uh, and you know you probably would have a protection layer for each thread to prevent them from writing either out <coughs> either outside their own area or perhaps into the heap. But anyway, um, it is more complicated than what we've talked about. the The, the good side of this is that because the uh, stack state is just sitting in memory. You don't have to do anything when you context switch. It's just, it's just sitting there. So, um, 
uh, thread number two doesn't do anything. I get, well, I get, it's not quite true. It has to ha uh, save its stack pointer in its thread control block. That's all it has to do. Actually, it, yeah, that's all it has to do. All right. Um, okay, so here's the thread control block. <coughs> and it contains, it only needs to contain the CPU register, program counter, and the, the stack pointer for that thread. Okay. Um, yeah, there's other stuff to do with its thread priority and so on, its share of CPU time and so on, stuff that the operating system uses uh, in order to choose how to schedule it. Um, yeah, there's a, bit of, a little bit of extra stuff and, and we'll see why we need this very shortly. When the thread's not actually running, it has to go in a ready queue and this stuff contains data about which queue to go into and where it is exactly. Also probably a linked list of other threads. Okay, pointed to the enclosing process control block or, or PEB um, and other stuff. Okay. Uh, yeah, and so the T TCBs are in a protected area of memory that only the uh, uh, kernel can access to make sure that they don't get damaged because they would severely uh, corrupt the, the whole running system if they were. Okay. <coughs> um, all right. So last time we, we looked at the uh, running lifetime of threads. And just quickly, they start off being created first. And before they can actually be run, they go into some queue somewhere. That's it, when they're in the ready state. They can then actually be run um, until some either interrupt or some kind of yield or halt happens. Then they go back into uh, a, a waiting state or if they're just simply interrupted, they would go back into the, the ready state if they're just interrupted by the OS. And finally, they'll be terminated at some point. Okay. So um, the idea for implementing this is the ready queue. So <coughs> uh, if you think about it, if you look at that picture I showed you earlier of my uh, task manager, if you actually counted all the threads, there's hundreds, probably thousands of them. So clearly most of them are actually not running at a given time. There's maybe eight of them running. The others are sitting in the ready state. <coughs> so we have these hundreds or thousands of processes to manage. And so we use ready queues to do that. We want to manage them in some way that they can basically instantly uh, swap back in independent of how many there are. Yeah. The, all right, so the, the idea of the, the context switch for a single threaded process or a, a thread doesn't really apply to a, a multi-threaded process. Again, that, that's the suspending operation, which is really quite different. Suspending a, a multi-threaded process does mean, it actually means typically unloading all of the thread information from memory. And so so it's, it's a much more massive step, but it also doesn't happen much. Most of the time the process, the whole process is read into memory and its threads are just put into ready queues. So that's, you know, it's really the threads that are getting switched, not the process for a multi-threaded process, which is also the consequence is that the, the, the multi-threaded process just sits there eating memory. Um, <coughs> all right, so, so most threads are in a ready state, but there's a lot of them. We want to make sure that we can uh, swap them back in basically in constant time. And so we use this, um, these scheduling queues. And so you can think of those as kind of a bunch of workers. They're in a ready state, but um, they're also arranged in a queue so they can conveniently spring to action uh, when there's a task. All right, so <coughs> there's typically a bunch of ready queues, in fact. And um, the ready queues are organized very often by a particular resource that could be causing a weight or essentially releasing a weight. <coughs> so 
uh, there could be a basic ready queue of things that are just ready based on the operating system. Uh, so, so those things are not really waiting on anything. They're just um, runnable, looking for a, a chunk of CPU to run. So, all right, so that's, that's simply a linked list. And you'll typically take the first element of the linked list, uh, swap it in, take another running process, swap it out, and then put it at the end of the linked list. So yet you use a, uh, a linked list with a tail pointer so that you can add, uh, pull from the front and add to the back. I mean, it's a queue, right? I shouldn't say linked list, it's a queue. Um, <coughs> similarly, well, you know, some, some things you may not be waiting on them or you may not have any, uh, excuse me, any threads that are waiting on that resource, and so that queue is empty. Uh, the disk very often will have stuff waiting on it, and again, we have this uh, queue of uh, processes or threads, and we can basically pull from the head of that and then push on the tail when we swap something out. Okay, and similarly, Ethernet. So is that making sense? So that, that way, you know, the, the reason it's done this way is if, you know, let's say if you had a single queue, and for instance, one of these uh, events uh, freed up or, or swapped out a, ta uh, a task, you'd have to look through the single list to find the next task that's waiting on that resource. So this way you don't have to do any traversal of the lists in order to find the next runnable thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm sure those kind of things can happen, yeah. I mean, uh, right, if you're, right, if you're, if you're running, that's right. Yeah, if the operating system determines that you're currently uh, uh, running, yeah, I guess I shouldn't probably, w w once, you, once the process goes into the operating system, it's no longer really associated with any of these things. Basically, something <coughs> stops the process that the OS is currently running. And when it stops, then the OS should have, should know which queue to put it in. So it's basically, yeah. So this is just for uh, the purposes of maintaining a queue such that the appropriate event will trigger a, the appropriate next process. Yeah. Well, um, the, the idea is simply that y you want to be able to um, maintain a queue, which means in order to be fair, <coughs> I'd like to be able to, you know, give every one of these things a turn, which means I want to, you know, pull from one end and add to the other end, so that if I keep doing that, it'll, everything will get the same amount of, uh, of time actually running. Okay. So, uh, all right, just to remind you once again, <coughs> project sign up is due by tomorrow. Uh, and, you know, make sure all of your class account names are in the application form. Uh, select, please, three times. Here's our section times again. <coughs> and uh, you should attend a section this week. So there'll be only, only two left now, so make sure you attend one of, one of the ones tomorrow if you haven't already been to one. Was there a question? Yeah. No, 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 no. I mean, the, the queues are, are just the utility that the CPU is going to use. Uh, they're not directly uh, processing or dealing with interrupts or states. What the operating system uh, will, you know, have a trap sent to it from, from either a disk event or um, an a, a running program that says yield because I'm waiting for something. Then the operating system can say, all right, here's a process. I'm going to suspend this process, but what am I going to do with it? Well, it's waiting on the Ethernet, so I'm going to stick it at the end of this queue. So how does it store everything in all the different queues and all the different processes that are there? So in a different, in a different, okay, that's one kind of trap, which is sort of a, a yield trap. Um, w the other kind of tr a system call that it'll get is that the, the Ethernet is currently, is, is just uh, cleared. It, the buffer is empty. So when it gets that kind of trap, it says, oh, well, look, I can run another thing, or, or similarly with disk. It'll get a, a trap that says the buffer is free now. When it gets that kind of trap, it says, okay, I, 
And if in addition it has a slot to schedule something, uh, it, it can take an appropriate <coughs> task from the queue associated with that kind of resource freeing event and then schedule that. Or even if I guess, you know, if, it, and if there isn't a, a slot to schedule, it may decide to preempt or it may wait a little while and then preempt the running process so that that, that uh, available resource can be used. Yeah. No, the operating system wouldn't know anything about what's going to happen. It's just not, it knows nothing. And, but whenever something does happen, it's, it's inevitably, um, it's, it's made known to the operating system through a, a, a system call or an interrupt. And those are always specific to a device. or a, So it, it, it's always sort of processing this, um, the set of events which are, uh, may or may not be associated with threads, right? Some events are not associated with threads. They're just this device is, uh, his buffer is empty. So then it can uh, uh, typically use this thing to find threads that care, would care about that. Uh, sometimes though the events do come from system calls from particular threads. And in that case, um, from the type of the event, that's how it determines where to put that thread if it's suspended. So it's really, you know, a few different cases. But there should always be plenty of information for the operating system to decide what to do. All right, um, so, all right, so we're at the break time, so let's take a five minute break and we'll finish up after that.
Okay, let, let's continue. And before we get going again, I just want to point out that I misread this, this day. I'm sorry, this is not Thursday. <clears throat> From this distance, I, maybe the font's not big enough. But anyway, so I'm sorry, but, but the sections are all Tuesdays and Wednesdays, so you, you had to already attend one this week. <laughs> sorry about that. <clears throat> okay. Um, all right, so, so let's now try to make the uh, operating system scheduling more concrete. This is, we'll give a very simple picture this time because later on we're going to explain uh, different strategies that operating systems use in order to provide various guarantees. But for now, let's just look at the basic function. Um, <clears throat> okay, so um, the operating system, the basic loop uh, is to uh, run a thread. You know, let's just say you start a very first thread, then uh, choose the next thread to run. So that's the sort of switching operation. Save the state of the current thread and load the state of the CPU. So that's uh, basically one traversal of that. The threads, the uh, thread tr PCB saving diagram that we had earlier. That's traversing from one to the other. Um, and it's an ongoing loop. So that's the main function, arguably, that the OS does. It switches from one thread to another, or one single process to another. All right. <clears throat> so if you want to start running a thread, we uh, you know, covered that a little bit. You want to take, assuming it's got a process control block, you want to load that into the CPU. Where does the process control block come from the first time? Well, a lot of the information is often encoded in uh, a, a run an executable binary. So the binaries typically contain programs and data, but they'll also contain any initialization of registers. So there's sort of a precursor of the process control block and thread control block that's encoded right in a, an executable. So you use that information to initialize the, the registers. <coughs> um, and if it's a process, you'll also have to initialize all of the other virtual resources, the memory and the I.O. devices. <coughs> and then uh, f from the initial data, so the executable, among other things, will always contain a, uh, a, you know, a, a start location, a start address to run, which you load into the program counter and then run. That's the entry point of the program. Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, so by now you have an, lots of ideas about. So how does the dispatcher get control back? Quickly, what are some ways it gets? How does the OS get control back? Yeah. The, uh, right, but and specifically, what is the I/O? Yeah, but okay, that could be a couple of different ways. What does it mean I/O? How does what physically happens in the machine? Uh, well, I mean, uh, for it to get to the OS, it has to somehow have a, a, either a trap, an exception, or an interrupt, physical interrupt. So the computer or some wire has to get, uh, yeah, or a yield, exactly, right. So the yield uh, is a software instruction in the program that will typically cause a system call as well. Uh, yeah, so we'll, we'll get more into that, but it, it, it does a sort of a special kind of call, function call, which also has the effect of, of doing things like priority switching. Okay. <clears throat> so, all right. So, we, we have some of these events. Um, <clears throat> the yield and we have uh, other kinds of interrupt events which can pre preempt the threads. All right. So, let's see. Internal events, <clears throat> waiting for some I.O. Uh, also, when the I.O. becomes free, that also triggers an event. Signaling is a mechanism that's a low-level mechanism for communication between threads. Um, and the yield, which is an important one, <coughs> which is a, a friendly way uh, of giving resources back to the operating system in your program when you've realized that you're in a waiting state. Uh, and actually, compute pi, this is a, a nice version of compute pi where it computes a digit and then returns control to the OS. So early, um, 
early operating systems, including Windows 3.1, and even DOS had a facility for um, something like multitasking by having lots of yield instructions in things like spreadsheet code. Since it had no real threads, the application code always had to call yield so that the operating system could start. Okay, so in our simplified view of the world of processes and threads, we said the threads only had one, there, there was one um, stack per thread. In practice, there's usually at least two, at least in Linux. The reason is that, um, that we want very different protection on user code and user state from kernel state. So in fact, um, user code's running with a, a, usually a separate stack from kernel code. So when there's a, a trap issued, let's say from a call to yield, the trap will actually trigger, an, uh, trigger a, uh, uh, an interrupt and the interrupt handler is going to actually switch the stack pointer as well and move to a kernel stack. And that way you can protect the operating, the, again, the, some of the critical resources, namely the stack state of the kernel from bad user code. All right. <clears throat> so now we're back in the kernel and we'd like to get to the other thread. So, uh, you know, we've worked through some of how this happens to do with the, uh, the queues. So depending on what event brought us in here, we can uh, choose an appropriate thread that, that might be waiting on some resource that we've just learned is free. Um, so we, we pick that new thread and then we do the, the switch, which is pushing uh, out the old con uh, process control block or thread control block and reading in a new one. And then also uh, flip the program counter. Okay, um, yeah, and this is a bit of subtlety uh, that I don't really think we want to get into right now, but it, usually there's some cleanup that happens later on. Even if this current thread is ready to be killed, we don't usually kill it right away. I'll, I'll get into that later. Um, yeah, there's a special thread that should do the cleanup because if we just do the context switch without the cleanup, we'll actually give better performance to the, the next thread, lower latency. Okay. Uh, all right. Yeah. So, <clears throat> so and as part of, of uh, switching, we want to save the state of the old thread and that's what's going into the TCB or PCB. And then we'll read in the new one. So again, here's the picture. If we have uh, a first thread, <coughs> it goes along and calls yield. That causes a trap, which then starts the uh, kernel code, which starts with its own stack. And <coughs> as part of the switch, we do an actual, we, we reload the CPU registers and when we load the, reload the uh, program counter, that's when the code actually starts executing the other thread. All right, and suppose that other piece of code calls A first, which calls B, which comes down and calls yield, <coughs> uh, which causes a trap back into kernel code does the preamble and sets things up to do the switch and then goes back to the user code. Yeah, I mean, this is not very really clear. It's going back all the way to the top to the user stack and the user code. Okay, is that, is that clear? Yeah. Oh, um, oh, I see. You mean what happens to the, let's see, let me think. Uh, yeah, so where does that get cleaned up? With this, so because, yeah, all right. So we're not actually calling A again. 
we're entering back here. Um, so in a sense, the, the stack pointer is going to point to the top of A, but the program pointer is going to point back here again. Does that make sense? So, uh, yeah, because once the, these, st these stacks are, pointed at, uh, are set up, uh, we're not, um, no, how can I put this? We're not making recursive calls. We're, uh, our program pointer doesn't go back to the start of A after the first call. Yeah, maybe I, I should have made, I, I was assuming that the context switch here starts off at the beginning of the second thread. By the time we come back to the first thread, we're coming back program counter right here. So it's not allocating anymore on the stack. We're just going to be shuttling back and forth between those two states. The, the kernel code though, this, this does have to get removed each time. So part of the switch is to, is to basically uh, e execute a, a, a pop or a return. It's like a call, but it's like a return. So it clears the stack and then starts running the, the other piece of user code. So that <coughs> the next time we come down to yield, it will uh, call, make another call and create a new stack frame for the kernel yield. Uh, but when it does that, it'll have a clear stack. So the cleanup code, or rather the, the switch code itself, is implemented as a special kind of a kind of return slash call that's going to clear that red stack frame. Probably should have shown that on the animation. Okay, anyway, <clears throat> is that making sense? All right, so uh, let's quickly examine some of the hardware details behind interrupts. So <clears throat> uh, interrupts are really physical events, uh, electrical signals that happen in the hardware triggered by things like uh, uh, data becoming available or data having been completely written um, or mouse keyboard events and so on. So those trigger transitions in the, in the hardware. The I.O. hardware on the chips recognizes those as interrupt events and associated with those events typically as special addresses interrupt vector addresses. And then in the, the uh, often actually in the standard memory these days, there each vector is associated with a particular uh, program counter. So in other words, it allows the interrupt to turn into a system call. So part of that, an important part of keeping everything running smoothly though is a priority system so that high priority events can preempt lower priority interrupts. Uh, but not vice versa. <coughs> because the interrupt triggers something that's like a system call, it may take some time to return from that call. So the, um, yeah, so uh, interrupts have priority. They also actually have masks as well. So you have the ability to turn off uh, interrupts while you're processing other interrupts. Sometimes you might have a low priority interrupt that has a critical section, so it can't be interrupted, and you implement that by masking out the other interrupts, which turns them all off. Normally, though, you'd like to leave the higher priority interrupt lines enabled so that they can interrupt you. All right, and the priority encoder uh, picks the highest enabled interrupts. Usually, they're coming at different times, which means it will execute a high priority interrupt higher priority one that, than what's currently active. On the other hand, if um, an interrupt comes in that's lower in priority than the, than the currently running interrupt, it won't execute until that one finishes. Okay. Um, so I think, yeah, and there's usually a global uh, interrupt GIE flag and there's you also usually non-interruptible, non-maskable interrupts that make sure that, for instance, uh, critical timers can keep running and keep uh, watchdog code running, especially in real-time systems, to 
make sure that some part of the kernel is always going. Okay. Um, <coughs> so, uh, in a preemptive operating system, there's a particular type of interrupt that's really important, which is timer-driven interrupts, because they're guaranteed to always be happening at regular intervals, and they're guaranteed that you always periodically go into the kernel to at least do scheduling and at least keep your uh, runnable processes running. <coughs> so, um, the periodic housekeeping also, by the way, will include cleaning up processes that are no longer running and so on. And it'll go back and start running new runnable threads. Uh, it's called mul preemptive multi-threading because the operating system via the timer interrupts is preempting and interrupting uh, running code. Non-preemptive multitasking is the kind that we talked about earlier where, for instance, in MS-DOS, the spreadsheet programs periodically call yield uh, and give control back at appropriate times. Uh, obviously, though, that assumes the code ex extremely well behaved, which no one expects these days. So preemptive multitasking guarantees that even bad code's being interrupted and al allowing you to run good code periodically. Yeah. No, no, almost never does a compiler insert any yield statements. Among other things, the, it, it wouldn't work unless those yield statements are executed close together in time. And it's undecidable, you know, how long it will take between one call and another. So <coughs> people, people do use it in real-time systems sometimes. You just put a lot of yields in so that um, it can increase sometimes the, I don't know, the, 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 the quality. What, what, what it helps do is that uh, it, it Putting yields in appropriate places makes it less likely that there's an interrupt in an inappropriate place. So it's often a good strategy for real time. Um, <coughs> okay. Was there another question? Yeah? Well, the, the, I mean, this kind of timer, it's probably. 10 milliseconds or 50 milliseconds, something like that. And it's just going to slice between different runnable processes. So, so it, you know, because it's preemptive, if you, if you have a program that's trying to run for 30 seconds, it's, it's just going to dice it up into little chunks. <coughs> okay. Um, <coughs> so, you know, the idea of threads was to have better cooperation within runnable processes. Uh, so that assumes that they cooperate with each other and don't compete too much. Um, it does allow you to share resources. And for instance, it sometimes simplifies programming substantially by not requiring you to have to replicate data that's used to service different, uh, say, different user events. So. Uh, all right, so the threads help you share resources. You don't have to replicate them for different uh, clients being serviced. Sometimes they also speed things up. Uh, yeah. They also push some of the resource management into the application code, which can be good for performance. Okay. All right, so if you imagine we wanted to build a threaded web server. Um, <coughs> Uh, it would have a loop like this, which is basically uh, accept connections. So, in a, a TCP system, normally you create a listener first on the server, which can accept client connections. Once you receive a connection, there'll be a connection object returned by that call. It'll block until it gets one. Once you receive that, then you can start a process to handle that connection with the user. And thread create, because it spawns a thread, returns immediately and allows you to go back in the loop and listen again for a connection. So the main thread here is always running and always listening whenever it gets a client connection that needs, 
you know, significant time though spent to service that connection, it spawns a separate thread to do that. Okay. Um, and so an advantage of doing this, doing things this way versus uh, trying to do a process version is that here we don't know ahead of time how many processes we might need. And we'd be trying to create processes uh, each time. And even though processes and threads have similar switching times, the creation's very different. Again, remember that to create a process, you've got to create this whole virtual machine, initialize a big chunk of memory, and so on. So that would be really expensive. <coughs> and you can't easily sort of anticipate how much you'll need. And even if you did, you don't know how many resources the particular processes would need. Very difficult. The threaded version um, <coughs> doesn't have that problem, and it can adaptively decide how much memory it needs for each client as it goes along. So it's cheaper and it uses memory more efficiently. Okay. Uh, all right, so the last idea is thread pools, <coughs> which are a way to basically create a better match between the number of threads that you desire and the number that can physically run on the machine. So, um, so thread pools are basically separate the number of thread, sort of running active threads from the number that you would like to run by creating something called a thread pool. All right. Well, we're right at the limit here. This is the last example. And um, we just, you have to look at this one online, uh, off, online I guess. Uh, but it's similar to what we looked at before. So you receive a request and then process the request uh, for um, an update. <coughs> And this, each of these uh, service requests might process I.O. In order to speed it up, we add a thread. Instead of sequentially doing the, the uh, operations, we, oops. Where is the thread there? Oh yeah, all right, we're getting into currency now. All right, sorry. So I think we'll perhaps go over this next time, but threads create a, an, an additional problem, which is asynchrony, because they can execute in different orders. Sorry, I'll finish that next time.